and we are rolling. Oh, sorry, we're talking to me. Who else would I be talking to? No idea. Are we ready yet? Of course we're f***ing ready. Right, excellent. We should probably get on then. Yes, good idea. We do have a slight problem. The guest that we booked hasn't shown up, so I thought we could just record your sections and then bring them in later. What? I was just telling you about the guest. Oh, don't worry. I've sorted it. What have you sorted? Well, I've cancelled them. You did... What? Why would you do that? Oh, don't worry. It's all in hand. I have the perfect guest. John! Oh, no. No, he's ideal and very insightful. He's a complete... <laughs> welcome, or indeed welcome back if you are a returning viewer. I'm delighted that you were able to join us for another episode of Hands on Film. My special guest today, John, is perhaps the only person who can offer you as educated and informed a view as me. Much better than that idiot Ben brought in last time. Mm. So, for this episode, we will be reviewing Thor, Love and Thunder. Why have you stopped? Well, that's right, isn't it? Thor, Love and Thunder. Yes, it says it on the screen behind you. Oh, <laughs> excellent. I'm hungry. Oh, me too. Oh, I'd love a good burger. Well, if you just get on with it, I'll buy you both a burger. OK? <laughs> ah, right, I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. Firstly, I've been told, for the sake of the really stupid people... You see? ...we need to issue a warning that we will be giving away spoilers or key plot points. If indeed you can call it a plot. The film starts with some guy who looks like a priest from the Mummy film. Uh, not the one with Tom Cruise, the one that wasn't shit. Although I do like a bit of Tom Cruise, I do need to make that clear. Except the Scientology stuff, but then if you're going to criticise Scientology, how could you not criticise all the other organised religions? Is he? Yes? I fear we may be getting a little off topic. Oh, right. So, next to the mummy priest is a young girl dying. Not sure why, don't really care. After she dies, the mummy priest seeks out her very own personal god, who instead of being sympathetic, mocks him. Fortunately, for the so-called plot, an awkward situation is contrived and a random god-killing machine turns up allowing the priest to kill the god. So what of Thor? I hear no one ask. Well, he's going through some sort of midlife crisis. He's been hanging out with the Guardians of the Galaxy, who have been shoehorned into the film if only for the briefest of moments. Thor is brooding whilst they are fighting some unconvincing war which is not going well until he finally decides to step in and sort it out, to a degree at least. Where did this happen? Do you mean, where was it filmed? No, I mean, did this happen in America? No. After this pointless endeavour, they come across a distress message from the female Asgardian which came somewhat as a surprise, at least to me, as I thought she was dead. Anyway, Thor goes to rescue her. The Guardians refuse to accompany him. Not sure why. He finds her, well, most of her, next to some giant dead lizard. From the female Asgardian, they learn about an attack on new Asgard, which apparently has turned into some sort of theme park. When Thor arrives, it turns out they managed to get the budget to tempt his girlfriend back into the franchise, although she was apparently very sick with cancer. She's gone to see his broken hammer, which has come back to life. Are you following all this? Probably not, but never mind. Thor arrives. They all fight some random beasts, which they kill pretty easily, but the priest from the mummy pinches all the children. Now... To any normal person, this would seem like a pretty perfect result. But Thor is not happy, so they head off in pursuit. Being clearly a trap, they first head to the land of the gods. The following is a scene that could have been lifted directly from Terry Pratchett's novel, Small Gods. What is Small God? It's a novel. So not like a hamster god? No. Their goal, to raise an army. 
You will be shocked to learn that they fail in the quest, but manage to skewer Zeus and steal his lightning bolt. With no reinforcements, they head off to the Shadow Realm, where they believe the children are, but saturation is not. The inevitable trap is sprung, a fight ensues, Thor, etc. run away, but the priest guy manages to capture the axe, which is key to his dastardly plan. <laughs> Lucky that. It turns out that the hammer is causing Thor's girlfriend's cancer to deteriorate. Immaculate timing being what it is, Dr. Thor tells her that if she comes with him on the final mission, she will die. So she heeds his advice and stays away. A high jest, of course. Thor goes, fights the priest. Pretty much what you expect to happen, happens. His girlfriend swoops in to save the day, but in the end dies. The priest has a predictable change of heart, bringing back his daughter, not killing the gods and himself dying in the process. There are apparently a couple of post credit scenes, but I was dying for the toilet, so I missed them. What happened after? Did the social service take the girl away? A after what? After they got back to America. That's a good question. It's not a good question. No one got back anywhere. The film is finished. It's not real. Why? I'm going to tell you that it's not real. You're going to sell the house to the house. What's the matter with you? Are you still alive? Is he coming back? Oh, difficult to say. John is something of a free spirit. I'm not sure how we're going to have the critical discussion now, though. That's a real shame, as it was clearly going to be an insightful discussion. Oh, exactly. Are you serious? He's completely insane. He doesn't even seem to realise that the films aren't real. Well, John works on a different level to you and me. At least we can both agree on that. Why don't you just give your thoughts and conclusion? Oh, yes. OK. Well, what did you think? Hmm. I have to say, all in all, I thought it was dreadful. Oh, OK. Well, what was it that you didn't like? Hmm. In the previous film, they decided to push the character down more of a comic route, which worked reasonably well. But in this film, they doubled down, making him a poor parody of himself, a little more than a clown. In fact, everything in this film is treated as the opportunity for a cheap joke, including Thor's girlfriend's terminal cancer, a subject that could have given the film some weight and balance if handled with care, which it wasn't, in case you missed where I was going with that. And this is certainly not groundbreaking knowledge, but when creating a fantasy world, you can pretty much do what you like, but whatever rules you create, you must strictly adhere to. Unfortunately, in this film, they displayed zero reverence for this principle and took a huge dump on everything that has gone before. Let me give you some examples of the nonsense that is passed off as writing. To start with, Thor appears to be going through some sort of midlife crisis. Well, the issue here is that they seem to be confusing the immortal god Thor with the actor, Chris Hemsworth. In order to justify the plot decisions, they continually introduce powers, skills and events that would have been game changers in previous films, such as, why did the hammer suddenly come back to life just now? Why is Thor's girlfriend worthy of wielding it? Because she's ill. Well, lots of people are ill. Thor apparently told it to protect her, but instead of doing that, it is actually killing her. Why does the hammer suddenly give her a Thor costume? That didn't happen when Captain America held it. The land of the gods. Why is this the first time we're hearing about this? And why does the priest not just head there and go nuts? They clearly demonstrate that they are ineffectual and absurd. But where the hell are the Avengers? The realm of eternity, or whatever it's called, if the axe can take you there, why did Thor not try to get himself there and smite the priest? Or, or why did Thanos not head there instead of wasting his time with a gauntlet? Why are we just hearing about this now? The golden rule of cinema is show, don't tell. Well, this film has no interest in wasting time on that silly idea. For example, 
Thor's girlfriend becoming a Thor. You could argue this was to give the audience a, a fun surprise. But that is extremely unlikely due to the fact that it was plastered all over the trailers. The god-killing butcher priest. Maybe it would have been interesting to actually witness his cruelty and power by showing him killing a few gods, thus creating reverence and a sense of danger for the character. <laughs> right. Well, thank you, Israel. Oh, and another thing. Why does Idris Elba's son speak with an English accent? No one else he lives with and has grown up with does, so where would he have picked it up from? OK, interesting. And, and what about that ridiculous bit where he gave the kids his powers? Did he not think perhaps this may have been useful before? And creating a child army, not sure about that. Whilst I'm on the subject, it seems to be a little bit of a glaring plot hole that the priest's justification for killing all the gods is that they are selfish and egotistical, yet he attempts to ensnare Thor by relying on the fact that he will selflessly risk his life to save others. Oh, when the priest had his inevitable change of heart, why could he not, with one wish, save a number of people, including himself? After all, we are told that with one wish he can kill multiple people, i.e. all the gods. Right. Chris Hemsworth said the film was like something from the imagination of a seven-year-old. If it was, then it wasn't a gifted seven-year-old. More like one that eats paste. Were there any positives at all? Well, it was good when Thor's girlfriend died. Um... What I mean to say is that it would have been easy to have concocted some nonsense to save her. So it was good that they were brave enough to kill her off. Anything else? Anything else positive? Chris Hemsworth's very likeable as Thor. He carries it well. Probably the best performance was, however, from Christian Bale, who gives a very solid, believable depiction of a tormented mind. He probably channelled his inner hatred of sound guys. Well, I have to say that I am pleased that you actually watched it and gave it due consideration. And why was it OK that Chris Hemsworth was stripped naked? Could you imagine if that was one of the women? <laughs> it's OK, because he's a man. Not that I'm complaining, you understand, but I just need to point out the double standards when I see them. I mean, if I looked like that, I'd never wear clothes. Oh, look, John's back. Oh, wonderful. Chicken? No, thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, are we finished? Uh, yes, I actually think I have everything that I need. We're clear. Oh, great. Oh, what the f*** were those goats? Mmm, <laughs> nice, John. I must say you surpassed yourself.